practicing. Awesome. All right. And I'm here with my friend, Mark Kravchak, who's located in Vermont and is the author of Coppice Agroforestry, a wonderful book. And we're just going to uh, tune in. You all can tune in as I just ask a couple couple specific questions and get, get some feedback as we're trying to um, work with coppice, coppicing and pollarding on our farm. Um, we're often doing this uh, for a couple of different goals. So one is to hopefully uh, create more plant material uh, for propagation. Uh, also have some folks interested in particularly in like uh, weaving material for baskets. And we've had a lot of inquiries about longer straighter stakes for different mm -hmm. projects like living structures. So I want to think about, you know, how I'm being more attentive to that goal. And then a lot around fodder for our livestock. Um, so coppicing where we might want them to free range and browse it on their own, pollarding where we might want to actually control the intake a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, Mark, can you just start off and um, summarize like the main differences yeah. between a, a coppice and a pollard, just for folks that aren't aware? Absolutely. Um, I really think of it being as simple as just the point of, or the, the severity of the disturbance. When you coppice a plant, you could not prune it any harder because you've basically reduced it to ground level, um, often leaving just a few inches above the soil surface. Um, when you pollard or pollard, I say pollard, but some people say pollard, a lot of people say pollard, but um, you're doing that at a height to be determined by your specific needs above the ground. And so that could be anywhere, you know, I've seen people with, um, you know, willows for basketry doing you know, two and a half, three feet, which is that a pollard? Is it a high coppice? It doesn't really matter. Usually that's for just convenience of harvest because they're not having to bend down. Um, but more often it'd usually be, you know, kind of four to six feet. Um, the idea being that those sprouts are elevated above browse height for livestock or wildlife. And that's largely the, the main difference. The other benefit with pollarding would be that you're able to control the stature of a tree in the landscape. So, um, you know, you've just kind of reduced the height overall, but you still get the shade benefits and some of the shelter benefits. And so you've kind of preserved the architecture of the plant in space, but then you're constantly on a rotation that you determine reducing it back to these points of regrowth. Yeah, that's really good to think about it. Kind of locking it in time, at least like some ways, but then you're just regenerating from one point, right? Over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so like on that tip, like a lot of, there's a lot of trees we've planted on our farm um, over the past, you know, 10, 12 years. And now we're like, you know, I really want to pollard that. And I was reading in your book that, you know, the best pollards are, are started young. And then actually it seems like a lot of the approaches are sort of opposite when you're working on trees for like a timber or, or, you know, when you're often training trees to put energy into that central leader, you might actually want to do the opposite for polarity. So I'm kind of curious, like, what are some of the basic steps for training and how it might look if a tree is like young uh, versus what are the possibilities or what are the limits also with like trying to renovate an older tree into a pollard? Yeah. Yes. So, um, I will say that like many arts of, um, of uh, you know, horticultural management with pollarding especially, it's, um, it's somewhat nebulous. It's been really hard to track down, like this is the best practice. This is the way to do it. Um, and I've been encouraged by reading Sproutlands by William Bryant Logan, um, which is kind of him chronicling his journey to find someone to train him in the art of pollarding and how in many ways it's, it is really an art as much as a science or even more so than a science, it seems. Um, and so I'm going to share what I've gleaned. Largely, um, my big aha moment came um, when I discovered um, uh, an illustrated guide to pruning by um, oh, I'm totally blanking on his name right now. Uh, Ed Gilman, he's a professor of horticulture in Florida. And he had an illustration in there that depicted kind of your optimized sequence of pollarding best practice. Mm. Um, it was the first time I'd seen someone actually commit to saying, this is how you do it. Mm. Um, I've 
read bits and pieces. I'm sure there's stuff in European literature that for whatever reason, because of language barriers or just, you know, inaccessibility, I haven't encountered. Um, <clears throat> but you know, the idea from an early, there's kind of two phases. Initially, it's establishing the architecture. <clears throat> and that's kind of what you were asking about is, is when and how and what. Um, the idea being that you want the stems to have um, matured enough and built up enough energy storage to be like of a large enough diameter that they can kind of handle the transition from this kind of early adolescent stage of development to then becoming, you know, these kind of frozen points in time where you're going to constantly prune back to. And <clears throat> as trees get older, well, first of all, it depends on the architecture of the plant. Um, you know, in if you're in a forested scenario already, you don't have a lot of lateral branches to work with. And so in a lot of cases, unless you're working very high up in the canopy, you're basically going to have to lop the top off of the tree. And unless it's relatively young, you're asking a lot of the plant to compartmentalize that kind of exposed wound and, and callus over. And especially if it's in, it, it really needs full sun to thrive, to um, so it's it's really a great practice to initiate during the first five to 15 years of the plant's life. And in a lot of cases, it's it's kind of similar to pruning a tree for fruit production, except in this case, you're trying to optimize foliage in most cases. Um, so there's probably going to be some heading cut at a certain point where you're 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 starting to limit how you know, the energy that's being put into upward growth and really focus it more into outward branch development. Um, exactly what that height is and how that translates, because you're going to get new sprouts that are also going to be racing up um, right. thereafter. So I don't, I can't exactly say at what height you want to do that yeah. exactly when, but, you know, fairly early, it, it's going to depend on the, each individual tree too, though. But, you know, once it starts to, you know, reach six, eight feet, maybe a good time to make that heading cut, um, especially when the tissue is small, because it's just, you know, more capable of callousing mm -hmm. over and, and, um, you know, kind of helping pre prevent decay forming. So like um, I have, uh, a poplar I'm looking at outside my window here that we have, and the, yeah. the trunk is probably now uh, close to six inches in diameter. Yep. And the first sort of lateral branches are, probably about eight feet up off the ground. I'd rather have that start around like five or six feet. Sure. But it sounds like what you're saying is it's a lot to ask the tree to just lop it off where I want it with this big open flat wound without any side branches <clears throat> versus starting, sort of starting to look at where those lateral branches come and, and starting to work from that point. Would that be uh, a good thing to think about? Probably. I mean, it, we start to get into some areas that I only have a, a general idea about sure. the limits of, which would be yeah. like you know, different species are, and even individuals, as I understand, within a species are going to be better at compartmentalizing wounds than others. And so the ability, you know, part of it is like how much living sapwood is still present in the plant. Um, how prone is it to decay? And, and just like, you know, we've talked about with fodder, it's like, to a certain extent, you have to try it and see. Um, yeah. I think, you know, at that diameter, yeah, you may be asking a bit of the plant to just like lop it as a six inch, you know, right. exposed wound, but it'll probably sprout because mm -hmm. the other piece of this is like how many years of production are you looking to get out of the tree? I think it'd be much more ideal if you're able to get to it with, you know, you make that heading cut when it's at the inch and a half to three inch diameter range, something yeah. like that. Um, some of the classic like anecdotal recommendations are to make these heading cuts or especially like the pollard cuts because that's kind of the second phase of things. Once you've got that architecture established, um, they talk about the, the diameter of a, a wine bottle or a woman's lower arm are two mm -hmm. like these kind of anecdotal um, descriptors, which to me it puts it in the you know, three, four inch diameter range. And again, mm -hmm. there's this kind of balance between um, having it not so mature that it's not going to callous over pretty rapidly and also has a good amount of energy storage and sapwood available and also a viable bank of dormant buds that mm -hmm. are present, but then not doing it when it's so small that, um, you know, the plant is going to struggle to you know, support the volume of new growth that's emerging from those points. Um, yeah. 
Hmm. Great. And one more question for you at this point. I wanted to show some pictures. We were uh, doing some coppicing the other day. These are osier willows. Yep. Um, and I've just been thinking a lot about efficiency and time mm -hmm. and energy and like yeah, yeah. how these things scale because a lot of my interest is in larger silvopasture and sort of like, you know, multi dozens or not hundreds of acres. So, you you know, it's nice to have one shrub in your backyard. It's very different when you're talking about acres and acres of stuff, right? So sure. I was just curious. Um, I know this from grazing, but, you know, here's one. We were doing some different techniques. And so here's one we did with hands, you know, sharp silky hand saws and loppers right and then here's one i just was like trying my little electric chainsaw right so yeah. you have this like <laughs> this like flail and i've seen this on the highway you know when they go through and they just kind of like rip everything and i'm curious like physiologically like pros cons like what's going on here and how does that affect you know because i know mowing grass versus having animals eat it there's actually a, a different response and so how would yeah. you comment the difference between like a clean cut versus something more more raggedy but that maybe took half as long yeah yeah or or even less than half as long um because at that sort of scale I, I i bought a um pretty heavy duty um brush cutter you know like a right. um, 10 inch circular saw blade with the, right. a pretty big engine and i mean i can just blast through this stuff quick and mm -hmm. it actually leaves a pretty clean cut it also so much of it depends on the angle that you approach things from yeah. too um but yeah chainsaw especially with small diameter stuff often leaves that ragged edge i mean it you're always having to balance that uh, those cost benefit questions um i think the big downside is just going to be all that raggedness leaves the potential for you know fungal invasion water yeah. to, to uh, accumulate but it also comes back to what the function is of that plant in your landscape and what the investment was up front and so again there's kind of no definitive answer um because you could you could spend a lot of time getting all your cuts perfect um and, and you know not end up getting very far by the end of the yeah. day so i i feel like you probably fine with that electric chainsaw um surface if i had you know especially with bigger stems that get shattered you know it it's different when you're talking about this kind of short rotation shrubby form whereas like mm -hmm. if i'm cutting a four inch tree for the first time and I leave a really ragged surface that that's going to be a bit more problematic. Right. Um, yeah. So okay. No, that's, I, that's what I was, and we've seen some resprout from this kind of thing that that's been just fine. So it, but yeah. it, it does like go against my pruning training, which is sort of leaving everything as clean and making sure everything's sloped so that water isn't accumulating that sort of stuff. But you yeah. know, you're not going to be able to take that much care on these larger systems. So yeah. curious, um, like, one stump we some of these we were just leaving kind of tall and yeah. chunky like this versus cutting flush to the ground versus just like a few inches off the ground like i know in yeah. your book you talked about like theoretically ideally it's flush to the ground but what have you seen or what are some things to consider in these different kind of architectures you're leaving behind yeah well that also comes back to to what your goals are um you know a lot of the reasoning behind cutting low to the ground as i understand it is you tend to see the highest concentration of dormant buds like around that root collar zone um secondly there's a lot of talk about or or, or text that describes what often they they call pistol gripping where you get this kind of swoop at the base of the new sprouts when um you cut higher up and mm. and also that you'll um, sometimes get new sprouts forming their own adventitious roots when they're formed close to the ground um, with a plant like this, it already has an architecture that you're kind of capitalizing on. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you could make a cut at ground level, but um, you have all these existing points of origin for new sprouts to emerge. And over time, your coppice stool, you know, even if you start cutting it low, is going to, it's going to, you know, increase in height. So um, I don't see any problem with this. If you were looking to produce, you know, super high value, like, optimal basketry rods yeah, you may run into some of that like low grade stuff down at the base and lose the last few inches um but based on how this plant was already growing to me that seems like you've made a good decision um you know what i usually think of is you you want to just always leave that stub of new wood from the last cut um so that there whatever dormant buds lie you know already within that um that stub 
you're, you're constantly leaving a bank of buds to generate new sprouts afterwards. And so that's where, you know, in some cases, if I can see buds on the stem, I'll just cut up, you know, one or two nodes above the base. Um, so I don't see any problem with that. I think you may just get, you know, if it was for craft materials, you may get some swoops and, and things sure. like that, but. Yeah. And then, uh, oops, that's not the right one. We also had some in here that had some nice regrowth, some mm -hmm. good shoots coming up, and we just kind of plucked out the dead and the the funky stuff, and just yep. you know, and so yeah, just curious like where where these things like and and just that's what we're trying to do is plant a lot and then just try different things and and see what happens, right? But I'm yep. just curious, you know, when would an application like this make sense? Like kind of picking and choosing a bit and doing that, which obviously takes the most amount of time potentially and yeah. it's hard versus some of the yeah. other ones we talked about. Yeah. Um, well, I, that it comes back to the same considerations we talked about, which is kind of time and value. Um, you know, there's this practice of that, you know, pruning or, or thinning a coppice stool down to the, the highest quality few stems, or even just like a single stem, they call that singling. And that was used to establish new, um, standard trees and traditional systems. Um, so certainly can be worth it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's the same idea in, in, you know, removing water sprouts from a fruit tree or something. It's allocating more energy to the stems you want to retain. Um, or if you're removing dead wood, it's just kind of opening things up a bit. So it really just comes down again to the value of that plant and the value of the end product. Um, so I think it certainly can be worth it. Um, but it, probably less so for something that you're going to browse with livestock or something that's providing conservation benefits as opposed to something for craft materials or some higher value use. Yeah, in this case, we are leaving some of these at the end of the row because the ones that we cut, you know, low to the ground, we're going to exclude the animals from. We thought this one actually looks pretty healthy. Let's leave it. It's going to produce leaf fodder. We mm -hmm. can give animals access to it because we're just going to put our net fence, you know, to include this one, exclude the other ones. And so we're not just completely eliminating a whole row at once. And then our hope yep. is that, you know, over time we actually have a, a, a spatial uh, diversity in terms of timing of these things. So they're not always all starting, starting from the same point, but you know, we'll see. Yep. It's been yep. fun to play with. Yeah, it certainly is. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Um, where can folks find your book and more, more goodies with, with this whole amazing world of coppicing? Thanks. Um, so valleyclayplain.com, clay, P-L-A-I-N, clayplain, valleyclayplain.com is our farm website where I sell our uh, the Coppice Agroforestry book. And um, the Coppice Agroforestry website, coppiceagroforestry.com has some resources for folks. And um, yeah, I'm thrilled to talk about this. It's great to see what you're up to. And like we've discussed, you know, so much of it just comes from knowing what the best practice is, but then breaking all those rules, you know, in an informed way. Cause the question always is, is not what are, what do you have to do to make things perfect, but what can you get away with? What's the least amount of input you need to achieve your, your end result. And um, so I think you're making some really good informed decisions and just learning by observing, which is the best we can do. Cool. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure, Steve. Awesome. Good to see you.